basically tackled each region one after the other. They're now in their fourth region um, in the planning process there, and the fifth region is going to be San Francisco Bay by itself. This example is from the second region, North Central California. And the goal there is basically biodiversity conservation, um, represent habitats across um, depth zones. They also factor things in like size of MPAs and spacing and replication. Um, and to basically do all that while minimizing economic impact. And then they have these three types of zones, which are no-take reserves, parks, conservation areas. And so what we did is we said, okay, you have, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process that has laid out the guidelines, it's laid out the science criteria, it's laid, laid out all the data that they're considering. And so we basically took the advice from the science advisory team. So they have this established scientific body that basically gives guidelines to the stakeholders who are drawing MPAs. And we took the, their criteria, and this, we used the exact same criteria in terms of the habitats that they, needed, that they were saying needed to be considered in their network. Um, so there was no, uh, you know, we, we, we did one where we, we, we did an exercise, and I'll get into this towards the end as well, kind of one of my, I guess, uh, issues that I like to pick at. We did an exercise where we took the criteria and the data laid out by the science advisory team, and then the st stakeholder said, well, hey, what about my favorite place here, or this data set here, or all this here, and all that there, and basically, you know, put all the data together and then run some regressions and some capital statistics and basically said, no, really, the scientists actually, the data they came up with is the right data, or the data at least to, to meet the goals and objectives. Um, so we, we, we took all this data um, and then from, or, or at least the guidance on what data to use and basically identified which ones we could actually get quantifiable and reliable and geographically representative information. And uh, some things we didn't have good information for, so we just left out. Um, so we used that information for setting our targets. And then for the socioeconomic side of things, we use data that we collect um, each summer. We go out into the field before each region that the, the initiative staff goes into. And we work with the fishing communities to map out their fishing grounds, uh, both commercial and recreational. And it's based on, we have, we've developed a, uh, an open source GIS application called Ocean Map. Basically, it's an inter interview process where we sit down with fishermen, they map out their fishing grounds, we ask demographic cost earnings questions. We do it on an individual per fisherman basis and then create composite maps of what, that, um, of what those fishing grounds look like. Oops. So this is just to kind of give you a sense for what that data looks like. So this is, um, this is a map of the Dungeness Crab fishing grounds for Bodega Bay. Um, so in this region, so, San, so this is a study region here. Um, San Francisco Bay is there on the right. We go and collect data for every single major port inside a region. We do this in every region in California and for all the major commercial and recreational fisheries. Uh, the value scale here is from yellow to, to green to red, red being the most valuable. And the, the, why I'm pointing this out is we, when we did this analysis, we considered not just the region-wide uh, uh, value of the fishing grounds, we did per port. We factored in like what's valuable to each port. So this is what's valuable to Bodega Bay for the crab fishery, and this is what's valuable to San Francisco for the, for the crab fishery. And so we're considering each, the value of each fishery in each port. So our study objective was to determine if, if any, any socioeconomic advantages can be delivered through a tool that allows for multiple zones than one that just allows for one type of protected area. And so we ran three scenarios. So we just ran a typical Marksan scenario, and then one with Marksan with zones, and then one with Marksan with zones, but then we actually included fisheries as our targets as well, in addition to our conservation features. And the idea around that was like, okay, can we, how, we basically wanted to see if we could kind of push the limits and, and determine is there a threshold in which you can minimize equitably across all the fisheries in the region their impact, but still achieve our conservation objectives at a certain level. Okay, so just to kind of reiterate, these are kind of the main three main things that you have to kind of factor in or address when you're going to use Mark Sandwich Zones is that you have to clearly define your zones. Um, so in this case, we define them again as reserves, parks, and conservation areas. But it, that's really kind of, if, if anything, if you're going to use Mark Sandwich Zones, uh, this is the one point that I, I, I would just like to really make is that you really have to define what your zones are. 
Um, if you can't define your zones, don't even really bother using Markzone with zones. Just use Markzone. Or don't use anything at all until you figure out what you're zoning for. Um, then once you've defined your zones, then you basically can then define what type of activity can occur in those zones. And then based on that, you can say what type of cost is going to be associated with, with a zone. And then the other thing is then the targets. You can specify those targets per zone. So you know it can, you, it can be everything from zone-specific targets, like you want a certain amount in a reserve and a certain amount in a park or whatever. Um, or you can just have it fall out into any of the zones. So in the, this exercise, what we did is we, we, we only considered, um, we kind of considered two top level zones and then some sub zones within the conservation area. And the reason we did that is because we only wanted to look at the commercial fishing activity and trying to minimize that. And because there's this kind of nuance in this conservation area where they go through a process and, and determine like conservation area high and then the type of fishing that's allowed in high. So in this case, this is showing the ones that are restricted. So in a high level conservation area, the fisheries that they do allow are salmon and coastal pelagic, so like your pelagic fisheries. And then in the medium, they allow things like Dungeness crab and squid and then conservation area medium, that's when they start to allow halibut. And then it's not until the fishing opening zone where they start to allow things that have a little bit more interaction with the bottom habitat like rockfish and urchin. So basically what this is telling us, or this what we set this up for, is this is exactly the same as the MLPA process in terms of what fisheries are allowed in which types of zones. And what we did here is we said, okay, if you're going to site something into a conservation area high, these are the fisheries that are going to be co it's going to be a cost to, and, and so on. Now, for zone-specific targets, um, what we did in this exercise was, and this is purely an exercise, no one said that you needed to have 30% of any of these features for it to be, you know, um, so that you're representing all of your biodiversity targets to a certain amount. This is, it was just an exercise where we said, okay, we, wanted, we want 30% overall, and, and we can only do 30% in marks and either, either or in a reserve or in an open area. But with Mark Sand with Zones, we want 30% overall, but we want at least 10% to be in that reserve. And in the next couple of slides, I'll kind of show the differences in terms of the, the costs that are going to be associated with those two scenarios. And, and I'm sure it will come out or someone will remark that, of course, it's going to be, um, you're going to have a little bit more cost efficient uh, outcome when you're only putting 10% in a reserve. But that, that's true, but it's also kind of the point to show that you now have some more flexibility as well. So we ran those two scenarios, uh, Mark Sand with Mark Sand with Zones with no fishing targets. And basically, you know, it, this is kind of what I'm saying in terms of stating the obvious is that you're going to have smaller, you know, smaller overall impact to fisheries when you use Mark Sand with Zones because it has that flexibility of addressing, you know, fishery specific targets, or I'm sorry, f fishery specific costs per zone as well as achieving those targets in that zone. So, after that, we said, okay, can we push this thing a little further? Because you still have quite a bit of variation in what those impacts are per fishery. You know, everything from salmon being fairly low, you know, just over a 5% impact to still around a 15% impact for your rock fish and for your urchin fisheries. And again, remember those fisheries are the ones that aren't allowed in any of the zones until uh, you get to the open, open area. And we said, okay, can we... If we included fisheries targets, can we kind of push the limits here to figure out if we can get you know, all of these fisheries, the impacts of these fisheries down to a point where it's equitable across all and still achieve our, our conservation outcomes of the 30% overall. And so what we did is we set targets for both our conservation features. So we still wanted that 10% in the reserve zone and 30% overall. So that remaining 20% can be distributed into any of those zones. Um, and then we set targets, so the amount of a target, um, and we set those incrementally uh, for the zones in which those fisheries could occur in and, and to see if we could come out with um, at what percent of target for those fisheries do we set at to, to where it doesn't, um, so where we don't, uh, where we stop meeting our targets essentially, at what 